Thank you, Pastor Nick, and thank you, BCC. I just want to start, first of all, by saying a big thank you to you for this opportunity, and it's a real honour for me to be able to share a message with you this morning. So, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to you guys. Um, and I just want to start as well by asking a couple of questions. So, does anybody in the room or watching online have a dog or used to have a dog or just likes dogs at all? Yeah, one or two of you? Okay, so when I was growing up, we had pet dogs. And one of my responsibilities was to take the dog for a walk. And when I would do that, one of the things that we used to do was play fetch. Now, I've brought some props with me. Now, this, I don't remember having these available when I used to walk my dog a few years ago, but this apparently is called a launcher. Now, I told the first service that it still had the cellophane wrap on. And it still does now, so you're not gonna, I'm not going to launch a tennis ball across the auditorium. You guys are all like, <laughs> panic over. But um, this launcher apparently enables you to throw the ball at a much greater distance than you could do if you were just using your own arm. Like I said, I don't remember having these, but one of the things I did used to do was I'd take a ball out, and I used to throw the ball or I would pretend to throw the ball, only to throw it or hide it behind my back. And I would watch as the dog would run down, looking for the ball and get all confused about where it's gone, knowing that I'd got the ball still behind my back. Has anybody else ever done that? Yeah, we've all done it. But maybe you don't really like dogs, maybe dogs are not your thing, but what about cats? Does anybody have a cat, prefer cats? Yeah, there's a few cat fans, yeah. Okay, so cats are, you know, interesting animals, and they will have a lot of fun from something like this, yeah? And the thing about cats is, you can dangle something like this in front of your cat's face, wait for them to start to take the pants, and then just before they do, rip it away. And you can do this over and over, and they'll have a lot of enjoyment from that. Now, cats and dogs aside, how many of us in this room today or watching us online would say that life can feel a little bit like that? You see, we've all got things in our life, whether that's dreams or goals, that we can sometimes feel are held right in front of us, right out for our grasp. Maybe it's an opportunity that we've been waiting for, and just as we're about to take it, it gets snatched away. Or maybe, like the case of the ball, it can feel like it's thrown so far out into the distance that if it's not completely out of our reach, then it's taken us an awful long time to be able to get hold of. And dare I say, maybe we sometimes feel like our assignment and our purpose in God is also in one of these scenarios. And maybe you're here today Wondering if God even has an assignment or a purpose for you. Has he even thrown anything out there for you to take hold of? Or is he holding something back from you? I think we can all sometimes feel like something's being held back. And I bet a lot of us, or most of us in this room, or watching online will have heard the phrase, you've got to chase after your dreams. Yeah? And yes, having dreams and goals is really important. It's healthy, and we all have a need for purpose and a sense of purpose. And God does have an assignment for each one of us. But can I put it to you this morning that our assignment in God is not something that we need to chase after. It's something that we need to surrender to. And when we understand how that happens, what that is, and how to do that, it takes away our sense of striving. And it takes away those frustrations. So we're in week three of our series called Assigned. And this idea comes from the fourth point of our transformation statement, which you can find on the wall downstairs in the foyer, by the stairs. And there's four points on there. And we have build, belong, become, and be assigned. And as part of this series, we're looking at what it means to be assigned. And we're looking at different characters in the Bible to see what lessons we can learn from them. And so today, we're going to look at the life of Elisha. 
Now, Elisha is a prophet who features in the Old Testament in First and Second Kings. But before we can start looking at Elisha, we first of all need to pick up the action with the prophet Elijah. And when we start this story of Elisha, Elijah is hiding in a cave at Mount Horeb. And some of you may be familiar with the story. God speaks to Elijah, but it's not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. God speaks to him in the gentle whisper. And so this is what God says to Elijah. So we pick up from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 to 21, and you can find these notes on the YouVersion Bible app as well today. So in 1 Kings 19, verse 15 to 21, it reads, And the Lord said to him, this is Elijah, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram, anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel, and anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak over him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done for you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. So when I was putting this message together, I felt that a really key quality in Elisha's calling and in Elisha's surrender, um, Elisha's assignment, sorry, was surrender. That was the key quality that I could spot in this passage. And in fact, I would say that there are three key areas of surrender as part of Elisha's calling. And today, we're going to have a look at what those are. So the first area of surrender is the surrender to God's will and purposes. So as a child, when you were at school and the teacher used to ask a question, how many of you, like me, would raise your hand really quickly? Yeah? Did you do what I used to do, which was use my other hand to hold my arm up even higher, thinking that's going to get me higher? And did you do the other thing that I used to do was point my finger as well? Anything to get seen over the rest of the children in the class to answer that question, yeah? But are there times as an adult where we feel now like we need to get ourselves recognized by certain people or certain someone in order to be given an opportunity? Maybe we're waiting for a chance of a promotion, and we feel like it's our responsibility to get ourselves seen above the crowd. Are we striving to be seen and heard? See, in the Bible, in Romans 8, verses 28 to 30, this is what we read. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. But do you notice in that passage, it says, to his purpose, to God's purpose, not to my purpose, and conform to the image of his son, which is to be conformed and made more like Jesus, not made and be conformed to who who and how I want to be. And one of the first things that we notice with Elisha is that it was God who told Elijah that Elisha was to be anointed to succeed him as prophet. 
In fact, there's no mention before this point of there being any interaction between Elijah and Elisha. And maybe there was, but it wasn't Elijah who made that decision, and neither was there anybody else there in the conversation pointing him to Elisha. It was God alone, because this was part of God's plan. And Elisha was predestined for this role. You see, God doesn't need our help to orchestrate his plans, but he does need our surrender. And if we are going to be surrendered to his purposes and will, then we can rest assured that he will see things through. And so we no longer need to be worrying about being seen or heard by the right people, because we can trust that God will take care of things and he will see things through. The only thing that we need to be mindful of is the eyes and ears of God. We just need to make sure that we are surrendered to God's purposes and will and not just seeking after our own personal interests. Let's remember that you and I are no different to Elisha. As followers of Christ Jesus, we are also predestined and he already has a personal plan for us. Our assignment has already been set. And we see this point made again, we're reminded of it in Ephesians 1, verse 11, where Paul writes, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So we don't need to try and make something happen. And notice that while Elisha is being called to become a prophet, he is out working in a field with 12 yoke of oxen. He's being called to be a prophet without him even realizing it. Elisha's simply taking care of the things and the responsibility that he has in that moment. And God is taking care of his will, and therefore he's taking care of things for Elisha. So our first surrender is the surrender to God's will and purposes, seeking what his will and purpose is. And the second surrender is the surrender of our need for comfort and control. So how many people here, or watching online, have been to the seaside, either recently or not too far away, or, yep, we've all been there, most of us have been there. Is anybody else like me? Now, I love the sea, but I'm not one of those people who goes on running straight on into it as soon as I get there. No, no, no. I'm one of those people who tiptoes my way down, I allow the sea to touch my toes and assess how cold it is, it's normally quite cold. I jump back, and then I do it again. And I allow the water to come back to my feet. And I will do this over and over until I've braved it enough to allow the water to completely submerge my feet. And then I go through the whole process again to get it to my ankles, to get it to my knees, to get it to my waist, then to get to my body. And I'm not gonna lie, this process can take me some time. And I can be with family and friends who have been playing about in the sea for quite some time before I've braved it enough to even get over to them. Anybody else has done that? Yeah, not just me. Yeah, we've all been there. But if I'm going to be really honest with you, I think there are times in general life where I do exactly the same. And I wonder if anybody else does as well. See, I think we can be so secure with the things that we have around us and the plans that we make that we find it really difficult to let go, take that step of faith, and jump into what God has for us. And I wonder if we're not sometimes tiptoeing into the assignment, or in our back of our minds, we've already uh, got an exit strategy. So we've already got the exit strategy there, and our mindset, therefore, is completely different because we're already going into it with a possible exit and a possible way out. But let's see what the Bible says about that. So in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 37, it reads, Then he, this is Jesus, called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it if someone is to gain the whole world 
yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And you see, when Jesus is talking here about denying ourselves and taking up our cross, he's not talking about martyrdom. What he's actually referring to is us denying our self-centered interests and letting go of our self-determination. And instead, being dependent upon him and obedient to the things that he wants us to do. So as I said earlier when we are first introduced to Elisha, he is working in a field plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And it's interesting to note the number of oxen that Elisha has, which is 12, because that would suggest that by the standards of that day, he actually comes from a fairly wealthy background. And although the work of plowing a field isn't easy, Elisha has a relatively secure lifestyle. But after Elijah throws his cloak over the shoulders of Elisha, which was to symbolize him then becoming his successor, Elisha slaughters his oxen, all 12 of them. And not only that, he burns all his plowing equipment so that everything that he had to enable him to have a prosperous life by the world's standards, he destroyed and he gave it all up. And it shows us his strong commitment to Elijah, to following him, because in this he is all in, and there's no going back now. And the commitment that we see here by Elisha is so similar to how Jesus asks us to follow him, all in. And not only do we have Elisha's example, but Jesus himself did this. You see, he was already with God in heaven when he lowered himself to be like us and gave his life for us in obedience to God's will so that God could make a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life with him. So what would it look like if after we've sought God for what his purpose and will was for us, we then made the decision to say, do you know what, God, I am all in. Let's do this. I trust you. Whether that's stepping out into something completely new or it's making that decision to dig in into the place that God already has you because that's the place he has you for this season. That's your assignment for this season. So the first surrender is to God's will and purpose. The second surrender is the surrender of our need for comfort and control and saying we're going to be all in. And the third surrender is surrendering ourselves to serving others. So I'm quite a clumsy person, and I'm one of these people that I can be in a high street or the supermarket, and I can trip over something or walk straight into something that is right in front of me. Anybody else done that? I can be so distracted by what's in front of me or what's happening either side of me that I can walk straight on into something, and I'm not even talking about something really small. And there's something about the fact that it always tends to be in a public place as well, never when I'm just on my own. And I've been with family and friends and done this, and they've said to me, how on earth did you not see that? I don't know. I didn't, and it's always so embarrassing. But I wonder how many of us are so distracted and striving for what we think is our assignment out there that we have our eyes and ears completely shut to the things that are right in front of us and right at our feet. And Jesus talked about this. In John 13, verses 12 to 17, we read, this is Jesus washing his disciples' feet. When he, this is Jesus, had washed, finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, because that's who I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor any messenger greater than the one who sent him. And now that you know these things, you would be blessed if you do them. And so Jesus has told his disciples that just as he who is God 
served them by washing their feet. They needed to serve the needs of others and follow his example. And now it's our time to do the same. Our assignment is never just about ourselves. Our assignment is about loving others, taking care of other people, and serving the needs of those around us. In the story of Elisha, we see that after he slaughtered his his oxen, he cooks the meat, and the first thing he does is he gives it to the people and they eat. And actually, if we continue to read the story of Elisha in 2 Kings, we see that there are 18 separate instances where Elisha interacts with the needs of those around him. And whilst being a prophet of God to the northern um, kingdom of Israel, Elisha's ministry was steeped in compassion and care of others. In fact, even here, we see that Elisha, he wasn't assigned to then take center stage. No, he was assigned, and then he went to serve Elijah. And even after he did finally succeed Elijah to become prophet, which was probably about six or eight years later, he didn't then neglect the needs of the people he came into contact with. No, Elisha was assigned to serve, not be served. And we are assigned in exactly the same way. So as I come to a close today, and if the worship team want to come back, that's great. Let's just understand that, yes, we do all have an assignment, and it doesn't matter how old or young we are or what our current circumstance is. But having looked at the story of Elisha, let's look again at the three things that we need to surrender and how we can apply them to our lives today. So first of all, surrender to God's will and purpose. Do you need to ask God what his assignment is for you? Maybe we need to lay down some of our own initiatives and ideas. Is it time that we stopped worrying about what other people see and hear and being seen and heard by certain people and instead trust that God will speak up for us and he will appoint us at the right time? Let's make a decision to start doing that today. Secondly, we need to surrender the need for comfort and control. How comfortable are you with letting go of some things and jumping all in for God? I know how difficult that can be. And I think sometimes I step into a situation with a whole list of contingency plans just in case. And actually what God is saying is, I just want you to trust me. Maybe for you it's not about stepping into something new. Maybe it's making the decision today to say to God, God, I'm going to be all in in this place that you've assigned me because that's where you've assigned me today. And thirdly, surrender yourselves to serving others. What are some of the things and some of the needs that are right in front of you right now that you can help with? Ask God to reveal those things to you, and then act. Seek his purpose. Ask for his help. Dig in to the place that he has already assigned you, and look for ways that you can serve. BCC, your assignment is not out of your reach, and it's not too difficult for you to grab hold of. It isn't about chasing anything down, It's about surrendering to what God already has for you. Amen. Thank you, Mr.